guys. Supper time. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Hey. Come on, supper time. Come on, pets. Peppa. No. Uh. Come on, sit. Sit. Thumb down. Good girl. Come on, pup. Come on, pup. Everybody come. Matilda, Ella. Let's go. I always felt drawn to the north, to places of solitude and wilderness. I'm not quite sure why I feel more at home, far away from home. But I think this is why I write. Come on in, come on in, come on, come on, come on. One is still missing, come on, come on. There we go, that's a good dog, that's a good dog. My characters and I are on a similar journey in search of belonging. And my experiences in the wilderness are a big part of that. Like 15 year old Emelou in my novel KKV, for example. Emelou and her mother have moved around a lot, but in none of the places Emelou feels at home until she moves to church in Manitoba, where she meets Barnabas, a young Enoch. Barnabas is training sled dogs for a wilderness race, and when he takes Emelou out onto Hudson Bay with his dogs, it very quickly changes the way Emelou sees the land and herself. The novel is set on Hudson Bay in winter, and sled dogs play a really important part in it. I wish I could be running dogs while I read to you, but it's summer and the dogs are waiting for the lakes and rivers to freeze. So this is what we'll do. Liz and I will take you on a journey by canoe, and I'll read to you from my novel Kaka V. I like to put my characters in situations where there is no out, where they have to completely rely on themselves. That's where you get a glimpse of who you really are. In this first reading, Emilou takes Barnabas' dogs out on a run for the first time on her own. Oh, and Kakawi is the name of a dog, a somewhat unruly puppy that doesn't quite fit into the team. Northern lines are changing color from green to red, tumbling north towards Seahorse Gully, like a river in the sky, becoming brighter and brighter in the north. I feel the urge to follow them. What if I took the dogs for a run? My heart starts pounding like crazy. I run to the house to pick up the harnesses before I can change my mind. I drag the Kamutik down to the river. I'm so scared that I almost feel sick scared of doing something wrong with the dogs, but even more scared of the darkness, of the things that I cannot see. I shudder at the thought of running into a polar bear. And yet, there's another feeling that's even stronger, as if my fear has woken it up, the feeling of wanting to live. It's like nothing else matters, trying to figure out how to fit in, to find out what I want, what Kitty wants, what the homeschool school office wants, what Barnabas and his grandfather think of me, what the librarian thinks of me, what I think of me, all that doesn't matter. What matters are those five dogs ahead of me and that we stay together, that's all. We run into the night, Seahorse Gully is ahead, the town behind and I'm in between. There is no moon, the only light comes from the aurora dancing high above. The dogs strain their lines as they pull me uphill into the gully. Keep going, keep going, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. I jump off the sled and run next to them. With my weight gun, the dogs pass me quickly and then the harmonic is ahead of me. I sprint as fast as I can and throw myself forward, grabbing onto the last cross piece before it's out of reach. The team comes to a sudden halt. I lie panting in the snow behind the sled. Whoa, whoa, have a, have a break. I'm not sure if the dog needs one, but I sure do. I pull my, myself onto the sled and then roll over onto my back so I can look at the sky. The northern nights are faint, but the stars are shining bright. I try to find the Big Dipper, the only constellation I know. There are so many stars that I get confused. Baldipili said that his dad taught him how to navigate by the stars 
and even tell time during the darkest time of the year when the sun would only linger near the horizon for a few short hours. A tiny flame shoots across the sky, a shooting star. Make a wish. I try to think what to wish for, but all I want right now is just to lie here. I think the scariest things I've ever done is um, running the Hudson Bay Quest. And at that time I had only lived here a few years and I'd come from Germany and I didn't know nothing about the Canadian wilderness. And, and then we started um, having, having dogs and traveling around with the dogs just locally. But one day I heard on the radio, I heard a clip about the Hudson Bay Quest that goes from Churchill, Manitoba to Aviat Nunawood, 250 miles of unforgiving um, coast and in that race they said there were inert racers and they would run on camel ticks and then clad in caribou clothing and I heard that radio clip and I thought right away wow let's go do it and we did so we gathered dogs and uh, we put in two teams my husband and I and then on the first race like a whiteout hit and just the whole tunnel just turned right around us and yeah, I thought this is it, I'm gonna die. And I'm just gonna read you a scene from Kakavi where Emilou kind of has that same feeling and the same experience of being in this gigantic vast landscape and feeling so, so small. When there's sun, the dog strikes are easy to follow in the contrast of light and shadow. When there's no sun, I have to strain my eyes until they hurt, and all I can do is trust that Barnabas and the dogs know where we're going. And then the wind sets in, snow begins to drift, wiping out the trail we follow. The dogs fade in and out of the drifting snow. The tundra is suddenly alive, the drifting snow a being with countless arms, constantly moving, clawing at my wind-battered legs. There's a strange beauty to it, a captivating power that won't let me take my eyes off the blowing snow. And yet, I have the feeling that this is just the beginning, that the worst is still to come. Barnabas urges the dogs on. How far to the Nala, I ask. Far, he replies. We travel on in silence, afraid we won't outrun the storm. Barnabas at least now is what a storm in the Arctic looks like. I have no idea. The dogs are running and yet we don't seem to move. I never thought about what infinity looks like. But if you'd ask me now, I'd say it's a dog team running into a whiteout. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and the most terrifying. There are these rare moments where I find I'm, I'm part of something bigger, much bigger than myself, where I can feel the connection to the natural world very strongly. Like seeing wildlife, I think, is the best example, caribou especially. There's something always magical about the barren ground caribou. If you follow their trails, it's like you're not just following them in the present, like in the here and now. It's like you're following something much older, something almost as old as the land. Like you're traveling back in time, and if you listen very careful, you'll, you'll find an older version of yourself, a version where you're not just in the wild, but where you are the wild. We watch hundreds of caribou cross our path. I feel goosebumps on my skin. There's something surrounding the caribou that I can't quite understand. The animals move steadily, setting one foot in front of the other, like they're in a long and slow procession. But they're not slow. It's almost 
like time runs differently for them. I don't know how to describe it. It's like I can see through a window into a world that runs parallel to ours. As if the caribou's presence here in our world was only temporary, a crossing place of sorts, where our world and theirs collide. Females with last year's calves, Barnabas says. How do you know? Look at their antlers. They are small and the calves are smaller than the females. They will chase them away soon, so they can give birth to the new calves. Here, my eyes glide over endless icy tundra. Further north, they go inland, way up to Kaminuyak Lake. What do they do in a storm? I don't know. Maybe lay down, wait? The last stragglers hurry behind the group. In the distance, we see a long line of caribou walking single file, ghostly in their silent procession. We walk back to the Kamatik, and I remember old Ippili saying that the caribou are like ghosts. They appear out of nowhere, fill up the land, and then disappear again. I strain my eyes, but as far as I can see, there are no caribou.